The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Sunday, 24th of May. The Fuji Cast. Welcome to the Fuji Cast, the daily Fuji Cast. Once weekly, now daily, just for unlimited time only now, because、uh, this time next week, Kev, you never guess what? It's going to be our last daily show. Yes, it will be seven left. Seven. Se- yes, seven left. Yes, well done for the counting. No, eight. <laughs> Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Well, officially it's eight, isn't it?、Yeah. It's a bit like when it gets confusing when you think, how, more, how many more sleeps to Christmas? How many, how many more days? We've absolutely loved it. It's been, it's been, a, it's, been its own challenge at times, <laughs> but we, we really have enjoyed it. It's, it and I, I'm very quick now in saying it, it feels like it's been my lockdown project. I don't know about you, Kev. Yeah, I think you can speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> What's been your lockdown project then? <laughs>、uh, no, I have enjoyed it. Yeah. So, this is today's is our 67th、wow. in a row. So, what's 67 plus 8? 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75. <laughs> 75 we will have done. Yeah. And then you add that onto our other. Uh, podcast total and it makes divided by four, so、uh, five times five is、uh, f- um, uh, 1,304 episodes. Yep. <laughs> a, bit like, a bit like Joe Rogan, although we, we are rather devoid of the $100 million、mm. um, contract that he's just signed to、uh, have his podcast exclusively.、Um, On the Spotify amazing, platform. It?、Oh, it's, it's just amazing. It shows you how seriously people are beginning to take the podcast、um, genre as, as something serious in media. Because when, when podcasts started, I mean, you had to be a little bit geeky to be able to do something with the RSS code and download stuff to your,、um, to your iPod. But of course, now it's easy, isn't it? Your apps and it's, it makes life, you can listen online to, to pretty much all of them anyway. So, everything, you know, it's changed, hasn't it? Dramatically. Do you know、yeah. Sp- Spotify's、um, share price went up? I can't remember what the actual figure was, but I think that they're either valued at, and there's going to be a bit, I'm going to be a billion out here, but what's a billion amongst friends? Either four or five billion dollars、uh, value now on Spotify. And, and their value went up so much with Joe Rogan because his episodes command millions upon millions, I think it's tens of millions sometimes. of... Of downloads. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's good for all of them. I mean, it's obviously you won't be able to listen to Joe Rogan stuff on anything other than Spotify now, which is the downside. But, you know, blimey, good for him. That's what I say. But how many, how many、um, subscribers do you think that Spotify will bring to their platform? Based on this? Well, I mean, l- let's be honest, not it's, not,、um, it's not just about the subscriber count, is it? Because as you just mentioned, their share price rocketed、yeah. probably by way more than the £100 million deal. Oh, yeah. So, yeah.、Uh, you know, they immediately made money rather than lost money by paying him.、Yeah. Um, of course, share price fluctuates. But yeah, I mean, they're going to bring a lot of subscribers, but also he will lose subscribers because 80% of the podcast population is on Apple. Mm-hmm. Um, iPlayer,、mm-hmm. iTunes, i i t h i n g i m a j i g g y It's a it's a big risk, isn't it? It's a huge risk for for all parties there.、Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. A, yeah, I mean, a risk in, in certain ways. Yeah, I mean, so you're going to get lots of people who will go to Spotify, and then you're also going to get lots of people who will just won't listen to him again. But at the end of the day, their share price has gone up. He's got、yeah. £100 million in the bank. Everybody's a winner. Chicken dinner. <laughs> Apart from us. <laughs> Apart from us. I do,、uh, well, I've got some news tomorrow. I, uh, was it, did we, did we, we did agree, I think, that I was going to announce it、um, <laughs> last week. I hope we did.、Um, <laughs> so I, I've got some news about my new podcast,、um, which is starting next week.、Um, but I will tell you that tomorrow. It's called Neil Without Kev. <laughs> it's not going to be the same. I wish you'd join. I wish, do you, know, I, I might, you might be my first signing. My first $100 million signing will be Kev. <laughs> He's back in. Kev's joined us again.、Uh, it's it's going to have to have a slightly different format. Well, no, a, a very different format. But、uh, I'm looking forward to it because、um, that's one of the big, things that. Big reveal tomorrow. Yeah, big reveal tomorrow. It's one of the things I've been thinking about during this, this down period is, is what's, what's going to happen、um, uh, in the next year. And、uh, I've got photographic plans and I've got podcast plans. But we'll, we'll reveal that tomorrow.、Um, guess who I heard from, by the way, who, who we were speaking to the other day. Do you remember I left him a message? Oh, Mishi. Mishi Monk. Yes. 
he, he sent well I'll, I'll, I'll play you he sent back a message hey Neil very good to hear from you that's a cool surprise thanks yeah I'm doing really well I'm in Hamburg and um, writing a bit we're opening up again we can go to uh, sports places yeah. again beautiful yeah and uh, yeah thank you so much you know please uh, give my best to Kevin as well mm-hmm. my very best wishes from Hamburg <laughs> thanks for your message he sounds like he's on tour <laughs> <laughs> Hamburg. What's, huh? that, what's he doing in Hamburg? Well, don't forget, I, he is German, though, isn't he? So, I mean, he, do you remember that the, the government said you should go back to your own countries, etc.? And I, I, I suppose that's what he's done. And his, uh, his, he was studying um, Sanskrit, wasn't he? That was his. Mm. That's what. That's what his uh, thesis was on Sanskrit. So everything yeah. he writes is in Sanskrit, which is uh, quite incredible. It is. Yeah. Love, love. Well, I wouldn't be able to read a single thing that he's written. But I bet yeah. it'll look amazing. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? I mean, he said the sports centres are opening up. I, I was um, this a, a weird sort of thing popped into my head because, of course, we know him uh, as having only three outfits in his entire life, doesn't he? And they're all the same. Do you think yeah. un- under those robes? Um, do you think there is well, what? What would his swimming trunks look like? Would they be? Would they be <laughs> colour coded too? Do you think? Would he uh, have... I'm not sure, but I bet he's a mean basketball player. He looks like a basketball player. <laughs> he does, doesn't he? Wonder what you're going to say then. Anyway, it's nice to hear from Mishi. Right, uh, ask Andres in in just a second. It's quite a long episode today. There's lots of questions to cover. Thank you for all your questions. But one from Francis Miles that's um, that's aimed at you, Kev, which I thought was relevant for this show. Um, Kevin, why did you? And I, I know you've answered this before, but people join at different times, which is great. Why did you first pick up a Fuji camera? What was the feeling you first got? Because you made uh, made like I am planning quite the switch from a big brand. I am currently a, a Nik- Nikon shooter, and I'm thinking either Canon or Fuji film. What was it about the Fuji film system? It was just the fact that it was smaller, and I could see the picture in the viewfinder, and it could get me pictures much closer in, and it was lighter, and it was just nicer to use. I loved the manual dials. I loved. I I suppose to. To make it more granular, I enjoyed using the Fujifilm camera, which was the X100 in those days, and I didn't enjoy using my Canon cameras. Yeah, that was it. But I mean, first up though, and you've talked about this before, um, you found the whole thing quite frustrating at the start, didn't you? Oh, the original X100. Yeah, absolutely. It was it was hard work. When it worked, it worked amazingly well. It didn't work amazingly well very often. Yeah. Uh, and they, you know, it took a couple of firmware updates to get into that camera before it became particularly reliable. But but amazing. It was it was a real eye opener. You know, it was one of those things where you just think, ah, yes, this is this is the direction for me. It seems it seems a strange question because um, what's your favourite camera is one of those sort of cliche questions we tr- we try to avoid. But um, would it be fair to say that the X100 probably is your is is if if you had a sweetheart in the lineup, it would be that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. It's the one I've been involved with the most in terms yeah. of well, I suppose that and the X Pro in terms of feature film themselves, in terms of kind of product meetings and things yeah. like that. So yeah, I've got a, I've got a very personal connection with that camera. Have you got every single X100 you ever had? Because I know you've sold a, a lot of gear. Oh uh, yeah, you're yeah. Not, you're no, I've, not, got, I've got, got all the X100s. Yeah. Well, I haven't got the X100V. I haven't bought that yet. No, but, but you've got everything that you've ever owned uh, X100 wise. You've got it, and actually, one of them has your moniker on it, doesn't it? A couple of them do. Yeah. So I've got a couple, couple with the 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 name on the serial number. One of them signed by the original designer, oh, wow. the original yeah. X100. Oh, God. So <laughs> that's all good. Yeah. That's a good. Uh, love it. Love that little thing. Yeah. Well, um, today uh, we're going to learn a, an awful lot about Fujifilm. Um, we gave you an opportunity because when we did uh, Ask Andreas first time around, uh, we, we kind of jumped on the episode reasonably quickly. It was right at the start of lockdown and we thought, right, let's get some content going. And so Andreas came in and kindly gave us his time for Ask Andreas part one. So delighted to have him back. He's the marketing manager in the UK, but his knowledge of the cameras, how stuff works in the firm's direction that he can share always thrills us in terms of having somebody in marketing who really knows how these things work inside out. So we've asked you to send in your questions about the cameras, the firmware, any suggestions you have via the show's Facebook page and by email to click at fujicast.co.uk and you delivered. And here's what he had to say. Thank you for coming back, Andreas, to answer some more questions. It's, it's. I don't know what we should call the uh, the sequel. Andreas, the return, the revenge, the, rev- um, <laughs> the revenge, st- strikes back. Has been used, I suppose. But, I, li- uh, I like, I like strikes yeah. back. 
um, you might need to with some of these questions because we, we, we Andreas get strike. I don't know. <laughs> well, let, let's go for them. Let's. Um, we've got lots of them. Leslie Burdett. Yes. Double exposure question time again. She says for me. I think we've we've had something like this on the show before, but you haven't faced her. So, um, are there any plans in place to one allow originals and combine double exposure images to be saved, and two to expand the double exposure capability to something similar to Canon's, which is really rather good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, probably Canon is the benchmark for double exposure and yeah. how it works. We. When we saw that X-Pro3 had new double exposure settings, we um, requested, we, d- we didn't exactly know how it was going to work, and we sort of like tried to uh, understand better what, what the needs were of the end user. We have requested the ability to select a picture that you've already taken. Um, I don't know if that will come. Um, likewise, uh, I don't know if there are any plans to develop it other than what we've seen in X Pro 3 first, and now we've got it in X 100V and XT4. So we, we have listened in that we have developed double exposure functionality. Um, but yeah, there's obviously still some improvement to, to go, but I don't know if the designers are looking at that, unfortunately, Leslie. Sorry. There's um, This question raises itself quite often actually when it comes to video because um there's a lot of um there's a lot of whispers about about the rules of video and vat and all that and taxes and eu tariffs and and so on and so forth so this is probably quite a a good time to to actually now knock this one on the head really because things have changed yes steve vaughan our own steve vaughan question for andreas how about in a future video orientated camera perhaps an xt i think uh, an xt2 i think he means a not an XT2. Well, I think it's just an XT type camera. Yeah, okay. A, an option to pay extra to cover the EU tariff so that the recording above 30 minutes is then possible. Um, so, as you say, the, the rules have changed around what is classified as a digital video camera because that, that was always the, uh, the issue that um, a camera that could record for more than 30 minutes had an extra duty applied to it um, versus a digital stills camera. So when the rules were in place, I think early 2000s, um, we lived in a completely different world where camcorders um, existed and uh, hybrid mirrorless cameras were just uh, science fiction. So the EU have actually abolished those rules since, I believe, July 2019, and they've changed how they classify things. Mm. So we don't have an issue from a, a EU tariff point of view. Um, and when I asked, um, which is why the GFX 100, for example, records up to 60 minutes. Um, mm-hmm. So there's still a limit. Um, we're always going to hit a thermal limit. So if we had a camera that had a big heat sink and a big humpback, um, then theoretically you could just increase the recording limit as long as your, your mm-hmm. card is. But mm-hmm. right now we, we're stuck between a rock and a hard place. So Steve's suggestion about the option to pay extra it's not really um needed but the option of a future video hybrid camera would be that it needs a big heat sink to get rid of all that heat that the sensor and processor would generate by recording so long right do you want two spiky questions on on screens i love spiky questions uh let's go for jonathan clapson uh, what's been the consumer response to the X Pro, Pro 3's controversial hidden LCD screen? How have sales compared to the X Pro 2? I ask as a very happy X Pro 3 owner. Oh, well, it's not spiky at all. I, I apologise, John. I've done you a disservice. But one who'd, uh, on balance, probably prefer the screen design from the X100V in an X Pro 4. So if we if we break down that question, how have sales compared to the X Pro 2? So the X Pro 2 was launched... Um, when it was launched, rather, it was the first camera to feature the X-Trans 3 sensor, which de- meant demand was not normal for a rangefinder-style camera. We had customers using X-T1s upgrade to X-T2s because it had the laser sensor and processor. And then eight months later, when the X-T2 came out, they switched. So X-Pro3, flip side of that, is the third camera to feature the X-Trans 4 sensor and processor. So we're actually probably seeing a, a true rangefinder uh, demand um so in terms of have people stopped buying it have people not bought it because of the screen probably 
did we expect to sell um, as many as the X-T3? Uh, no. Um, did we expect to sell as many of the X-Pro2? Um, no, because it wasn't launched in the same environment. Um, it's part of the reason why the X-Pro3 has gone down that super niche route of street reportage um, type with, with the screen, that the, with the controversial screen. Mm. Because it was being launched at a time where if you just put exactly the same insides as the T3 in exactly the same body, it's like, well, what have you actually achieved? Mm. So it was able to carve its, not carve a, a new market, but it was just appealing to the people that liked rangefinders, liked it for a particular reason. And I mean, no brand keeps every single customer happy. Mm. We need to be able to frustrate some customers because then we can make new cameras. <laughs> Like a like an XT4. What? Yeah, like an XT4, which, or an which X-Pro4. is a controversial yeah. screen. Well, we'll come um, we'll come back to that though. Overall consumer response, yeah, it, yeah. it's been mixed, um, as we've seen from from the reviewers as well as the customers. But um, overall, it's performing as we expected yeah. it to. Um, Jonathan had a part two uh, here. Where is the limit for APS-C sensors in terms of pure mega megapixels, and, and where does Fujifilm go when this maximum is reached? Um, I honestly don't know what the limit is. Well, the, well, rather the limit now for APS-C sensors based on fabrication technology and lens technology and all of that is not the limit that we will have in three or four years' time. Yeah. I, I, there are definitely computer scientists out there that said we will never see X, Y, Z in a computer, and now we've got mobile phones that are more powerful than the computers that allegedly sent um, people to the moon. Yeah. So... From uh, it's not a question that I want to be pinned down on an answer because right now uh, we we just simply don't know. David Murray, here we go then. Stand by. A question for Andreas. For me, I find the introduction of the uh, flip out to the side screen, a la Canon on the XT4, disturbing for reasons only pertinent to me and many others, I guess, who are drowned out by YouTube vlogging brigades. I despise this type of screen. I find it completely unworkable, slow, and the antichrist of street photography. Don't hold your punches, David. And documentary photography, and also for video, unless you want to film yourself. So I'd like to know, now that this screen has unfortunately found its way onto the X-T4, will this be the norm for future cameras, or will you introduce the much better and faster X-T3 flip screen back into, say, the next generation X-H2, for example? I'm just about to reinvest in Fujifilm and was to purchase an X-H1, but if the X-T4 screen will now be the norm, I can't and won't. Thanks for your time. Um, <laughs> you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. You we just talked about the controversial X Pro 3 screen, which was designed with um, street photography and documentary photography uh, people in mind. And yeah, a lot of people feel that the side slip, flip out screen is just for bloggers. Um, but all, all the camera reviewers um, that have had XT4s up until now seem to say that it's just a different way of working. Yeah. Um, from, from my point of view, I, I can't comment about what features will come to theoretically unannounced future products. So unfortunately, David, I can't say um, what screen might come to the next XH camera. Um, it, it is something that people have, uh, I'm, perhaps I'm being a bit unfair to David, because you can make questions sound how you want to when you're the host and you read them yeah. out in a certain way. Uh, but but David does have a point, because a few people have mentioned this, that they felt mildly uncomfortable about it. I personally don't understand why, Andreas, because in the in the studio, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, you know, I've done some vlogs, but I'm not a vlogger as such. I find that flip round capability really useful. Now, I'm using the X-T3 at the moment. I've only used yeah. the X-T4 a little bit. But I, I tell you what, I'll use it for, for that because that would be really handy. Yeah. The, th the thing is, you, you're never going to keep absolutely everyone happy. The first, If you look at, say, like camera reviewers when the X-T3 came out, they're like, great, you've put all this functionality of video in, but you haven't put a flippy out screen. We've now put a flippy out screen, and mm. now all the stills photographers have... <laughs> <laughs> woken up and said hang on a minute i don't like flippy out screen so um it you're damned if you do and yeah. you're damned if you don't yeah. in a in a perfect world we would have had two versions of the camera um one with a flippy out screen and one without a flippy out but then screen, it would have cost then, more it would have cost more and, because, then, yeah. and then we would have cost more yeah. because we would have double the inventory yeah. and and what have you so um i'm i'm sorry david that 
he doesn't like the flippy out screens and it's like from a waist level shooting point of view i can understand that he feels yeah, the yeah, um, yeah, yeah. the camera doesn't uh, isn't as flexible john taylor will the gfx 50r see any firmware updates and stroke or will fuji film update the x uh, gfx 50 line with a phase detection version or is the gfx 50 line consigned to history um so again f- future products future firmware updates when they might come i mean i can't confirm anything but all good things come to those who wait in in my experience um with regards to updating the gfx um i think we'd call it a gfx rangefinder style um because that's really what what it is because yeah. the 50 refers to the the megapixel count we're, we're governed by what 44 by 33 millimeter sensors are available by the various fabrication people and while we customize them to some degree we can't just say to people make a 73.6 million pixel sensor because that's what we fancy in the next camera it it really is that sometimes the the tail wagging the dog um, rather than the other way around so um will i expect to see a replacement to the gfx 50 uh rangefinder style yeah I, I do expect to see a replacement because we're not giving up on on that um the gfx series but uh, what sensor it will have will it have phase detection pixels again i, I don't want to speculate about what future products may or may not have uh, we've got quite a few questions that come, come in from our American friends, which is fantastic. That's one of the reasons we gave you a, a bit more lead time on this mm-hmm. one. Uh, Dennis Gottlieb from uh, New York City. A question for Andreas regarding the 50mm uh, F1. First yes. off, thank you for making this lens and these amazing little cameras. I am truly in love with them. I was fascinated to hear the team discuss the decision to switch the F1 lens from a 35mm to a 50mm due to size, and that got me thinking. Given that you already have the much-loved 5612, did you contemplate doing a 70mm to further differentiate it from the 56? Personally, while I'm very excited about the 50, I think I'd prefer a 70. Thanks for humouring a noob and making such inspiring tools. Stay safe. So when we first got wind that the 33mm F1 was just going to be over one kilo, need a tripod collar, and and the various things that we discussed um, when we had the X-Summit, um, we looked at the the options and and I'll be honest, the seventy mil was never discussed. Right. Um, we always looked at a sort of a forty or a or a sort of like somewhere in between thirty three and fifty to give a sort of um, a standard lens. Who knows, based on the success of the fifty mil f one, when it finally arrives, whether or not the the team will look at other super fast primes. Mm. Um, I think it's uh, inevitable. Um, but like most things, it needs to. We, we need to base these decisions on commercial success, not just um, aspirations of of the uh, the consu- of of the small segment of the consumers. Yeah. Mike Watton, Australian question for Andreas. Uh, you have a Fuji. You, you may or may not be ans- uh, able to answer this one. I don't know. You have a Fuji shop in the UK selling refurb and X loan equipment. Brilliant. Where in Australia do you sell Southern Hemisphere similar stock? So I actually saw this question on Facebook, and instead of uh, being able to say, uh, I, I don't know, I actually asked the Australian general manager, and he got yeah. back to me. And so they are working on a few ideas for refurbished cameras, um, but I, I don't have the details that, that I can share. Whether or not that's going to be a model that they sell direct, whether or not they're going to pick a few key retailers and sell via them, um, I, I simply don't have that information okay. but they sit, did note that um there is a demand for sort of like second-hand refurbished cameras and they are looking into it that refurb center is so valuable isn't it my xh1's a refurb i think uh, um I, I think i've had a couple of refurb cameras they've always been very good it's been a really good service yeah, we we are blessed um and very lucky in the uk to have the service center that we do the the team do a great job um we get um, any camera that that's come back for any reason, be it an X display model, a sort of a, a customer return from within fourteen days, someone that says there's a fault, but actually on on further inspection, it, there, there's no fault. It goes into this refurb pot, um, and the team do do a great job um, of doing that. We, it's it's a perfect uh, storm of having the the right size country, because um, obviously places like the US, it, you get much more. Uh, difficulties when when you're that sort of scale yeah. um having the the experience and having the the uh, team that we do um this one's from garish balasabramaniam 
Have you ever heard of Alor Setar, Kedda? We no. really, we're really leaping around the world. We're in Malaysia now. Okay. Concerning the in-camera clarity setting on the X100V and the X-Pro3, it creates a lag each time saving the image, subsequently creating difficulties when out shooting and wanting to take successor pictures in a street of fast-moving objects. I've realised that this isn't solved even when using the UHS-2 card. Is there a fix for this, Andreas, or a future update potentially addressing this? Does Fujifilm know about this at all? Yeah, I mean, I th- the, the guys wouldn't have launched the camera without knowing that that was one of the limitations of the setting. It used to be the same issue with the colour chrome effect on the GFX um, system, that it would just delay everything. So right now, I'm not aware of any firmware update ability to remove that um, delay Um, my only recommendation would be to shoot raw um, and process and add the clarity afterwards because you can do that later in camera by doing the raw conversion um, after it's it's not ideal um, and i'd love to be able to say yeah we know about it we're we're working on it but normally when there's a delay it's because there's a hardware um, limitation uh, processing function happening so my, my recommendation would be to try and shoot raw and then when you're in playback you can add the clarity later so you're not limited by the speed of the camera when you're shooting um you can grab a coffee yeah. and then to like do your processing afterwards so a slight work around at the moment and, and watch this space it would be my, it, my my recommendation would be that work around um but as i said I, i'm not normally when when there's a a lag like that between shots it's because there's a hardware limitation yeah. not a firmware thing yeah i, I always think these uh, ask andrea sessions and whenever we've had you on the show which which is re- reasonably regular in the last last year and a bit yeah. now um that these do these do turn into a bit of a firmware request session um, and, and we've got no issues with, <laughs> yeah. with firmware requests and, and we do pride ourselves in trying to listen to uh, as many requests as possible we we in the uk collate them every quarter and, and pass them on i i don't have got no issues doing that the, the problem is ultimately is if you get 50 requests yeah it's not possible for the engineers to do 50 requests yeah. but what i've found is that if they came back to us and we requested 50 things and they did five they won't do the five the the top five they'll just do five yeah. So it's always better to go back to them and say, right, which ones are the ones that we need and which ones are the ones that we want? But but they do listen, though, don't they? And every single time I think we mention stuff to you, I, I get this feeling that it does go in. It, it, go, it definitely goes to the engineers and the product planning team. The, the challenge that we've had over the past year, um, and we, we discussed this um in the pub when we were allowed to be in pubs yeah. a few months ago. Oh, those days. Um, no, those those days. Um, the olden days. It It's more about the fact that we've got limited resources. The team are working. The same team that write the software for existing cameras are writing the software for new cameras. And where, and ultimately, that firmware to write for, for an existing camera needs to fit into the schedule of um, when new products are being launched. Yeah. So if you think to yourself, uh, we had X Pro 3 in o- end of October. We had X100V announced in February. We had XT4 a month. L- so there has been no time for that team to, to write yeah. firmware for anything yeah. other than the new product. So while a lot of people have been frustrated, and I am and I am one of them, that, that things like the XT3 haven't had any love shown to them with any of the new features, uh, that, that we've announced in Pro 3, X100V and, and X-T4. Mm. It's sort of, it's just the nature of the beast. Tell them, to, tell them to double down, get on with it. What are they doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Holiday? Yeah, well, Honestly. Why, yeah. why are they sleeping? <laughs> yeah. um, well, why, why don't we just add this one to the list? Because I'm not sure you can answer it, but it can at least be added to the list. Paul Gallagher, hi, Andreas. Would it be possible to implement Snap Focus on the X100V as a firmware update? And this and the full press snap is something that's become a real favourite of Rico shooters on the, on the GR series. W- would it be possible? Well, yeah. technically, most things are possible, yeah. but is it likely is, is another question. <laughs> I think um, Paul on Facebook, when he wrote this question, went on to explain why and this, that and the other. And from our point of view, we have introduced focus limiter in the X100V, so mm-hmm. you can set the camera to only focus at a certain distance. So I don't understand why this feature is different to the focus limiter function. I haven't had a chance to check it on an X100V, but I would argue that it's very similar. It sounds very similar to a focus limiter. Right. Okay. 
Um, and I think Paul went away happy with that one, didn't he? And Adnan Onar, um, uh, he's, he's a re- reasonably regular uh, writer, actually. Um, and I forget, Adnan, I do apologise what part of America you're in. But a question for Ask Andreas. Can we expect from Fujifilm a tough camera comparable to uh, Olympus Tough Series, G- uh, TG06? I had no idea about the Olympus range, to be honest. Uh, I'm aware that the Fujifilm has the, the XP series, and I've got one of those myself, actually. But, but it would be good to have something with a somewhat larger sensor and raw file option, and maybe a little better looking, just one wondering no it's not on our radar i think we've got um the compact camera market is a very very um challenging sector of the business and we've seen um since the introduction of cameras and smartphones and that improve that has been the the area that's taken the the biggest beating um right. tough cameras like um our own xp series the olympus i think pentax make one still right. and then nikon have one panasonic as well um is again a unique because it offers a particular um thing but what we find is the majority of people buying them are for holidays for beaches for swimming pools for mm. that sort of area and that's exactly how so, we use ours uh, yeah so there we go yeah so so from from our point of view you don't want to make that sort of camera for families too mm. expensive no so at around so in the uk they're about 130 to 150 quid um the olympus cameras tend to be almost double that so from our point of view, we've got an area of the market in that we've got the affordable family, tough, rugged mm. uh, family holiday camera. And then Olympus have got that step up market. And right now, not too many people, not too many manufacturers are keen to carve out yeah. other areas. We, yeah. we, we talked about this camera the other day on the show and, and uh, Kev always calls them the the, uh, the type of cameras you buy from Dixon's Worldwide before you get on an airliner. Yeah. Uh, which and, they there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I know Kevin's a snob. But, um, I tell you what, he goes yeah. into Dixon's well, but I saw him popping one when we went to the airport recently. He goes and he just doesn't yeah. admit it. That's all. Yeah. Wayne Carson, question for Andreas. This episode, please. Apart from the flippy screen, what can stroke can't a potential firmware update bring to the X-T3 to match the X-T4 performance or will it? So this is all uh, theoretical um, in terms of what you could based on the fact that the sensor and processor on the X-T3 is exactly the same as the X-T4. Um, theoretically, the AF speed could be improved. The low light speed could be um, go down to minus 6 EV. Um, classic negative could be added. Um, the precision steps for tone settings could be added. Um, what's, the, the li- what's the likelihood of these then? Okay, are you able to comment on that? No, no, I, I don't know. But but they are but they are things that people ask for. I would imagine reasonably. These, these are all th- yeah. yeah, yeah. These are all things that that I have been asked for, and these are all things that, um, as I said, these are all things that theoretically could be yeah. added to a T three. Um, monochromatic color, clarity, the expo- yeah. the advanced ex- um, multiple exposures, the autofocus bracketing, the auto mode, um, the advanced tracking AF the advanced uh, face detection, the bleach bypass, the video backup recording. I mean, that, that, that ha- cards. there has to be a limit at some stage. Otherwise, you, you, you might as well not buy the next generation camera. So who makes yeah. the, who makes the decision on, on which of these? Somebody says, well, you know what? We'll throw an olive branch in here. Let's do that one. Yeah, and, and it was a chat I was having, to, having um, on online, I remember, with, with Peter in terms of where do you draw the line between... Um, rewarding and loyalty and and fueling loyalty by by giving people firmware updates um and peter was of the opinion that we have to keep on doing it because we'll it'll pay dividends in the future but i think we've seen that what will happen is sensor and processor uh lifespan will increase in terms of we're not going to be on a, a two-year cycle it might be a three or a four-year cycle and when as soon as you're in a three or four-year cycle you might be using the same sensor and processor into different camera generations um so there's we we've made a rod for our own back in historically in terms of as soon as a camera was coming out um previously we would announce the firmware update for the same sensor and processor um, within reason and xt3 has been the first camera that we've gone quiet with uh in terms of the pro 3 came out with loads of new features mm. we haven't announced uh loads of uh, firmware updates for t3 and we strongly believe that the t3 is uh deserving of these um, new bits of firmware um but the cost of creating new firmware is millions so mm. it, it can run into millions rather so it's not just a copy and paste job of no. uh 
existing firmware to go because uh, there are slight hardware differences between each camera. So there isn't the, ultimately the buck stops with our general manager and his decision is final. The balancing act is by adding this functionality, are we removing sales while rewarding existing users? Are we removing sales of new products? And this is the same for every single camera manufacturer. This is an exclusive to us. It's like, yes, we want to reward loyalty. We have been um, giving firmware updates for, I think, seven, eight years now. But what functionality is needed and what functionality is wanted? Um, yeah. And that that's the balancing act. But for me, I would like to see the faster AF, the phase detection autofocus, the classic negative film simulation, things like the autofocus bracketing, um, the advanced AF, everything that's AF related, add it to the T3, mm -hmm. but maybe things like the digital image stabilization, the video backup recording, don't add it. Yeah, well. and, and otherwise, you, I mean, you're not you're not going to have the the cash. Well, not exactly slopping around, but but available to start start developing other products if you yeah, if you yeah, give it, it all away at the same time. It, it is a completely vicious circle, and and I'm not yeah. suggesting for a second we've given up firmware updates. Um, it is something that we will continue yeah. to do. Um, just the frequency of them might be reduced, and and what we're able to do. Yeah, you need you need to weigh up the, the commercial implications of, of firmware updates. Right, this one's a hardware one, so I think I know the answer to this immediately. But I'm gonna I'm gonna pose it anyway. Joseph, a bad question for Andreas. To, to my understanding, the X70 seems to have been marketed as a cousin to the X100 series. I love the the dedicated aperture ring and articulating LCD screen in the X70. Uh, that its successor, the XF10, lacks. Any hope of a remodeled update to the XF10 or an update in general? Yeah, I mean, talk of future products is always going to be difficult because, well, we haven't announced them. No. I mean, personally, I always wanted to see a success, a true successor to the X70, so this this mythical X80. But um, demand for premium compact cameras like the XF10 and X70 are reducing every month. Um, so, like, spending £500 on, on a compact, £600, um, I remember when the X70 came out, people were saying, oh, it, it needs a viewfinder. So, well, that's an X100. So yeah. that sort of price in the market, the five to seven fifty, eight hundred pounds, it is sort of like a, a very difficult uh, market yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, personally, I think it's more realistic that we would expect to see some sort of super compact interchangeable lens camera um, with, with maybe uh, using the pancake lenses and things like that. So, I, I think that's more realistic because the interchangeable lens market, especially the mirrorless side, is still relatively strong, COVID aside. Yeah. Um, but that that's where I would see, I would expect to see future developments well, let's rather go, than a replacement. Well, let's go from compact to, to a much larger camera, the GFX. Uh, Leon yeah. Droby, uh, the X-Pro1 uh, 35mm 1.4 was what lured me away from the DSLRs. After a couple of years with that combination, I started trying other cameras. What I learned was that I prefer high-res sensors and IBIS. The GFX 50R, now that would be the perfect camera for me. If only it had IBIS. Any chance to see a stabilised GFX 50R in the near future? Um, never say never, um, but yeah, again commenting about future products yeah. is that is that a question you get quite regularly the the image stabilization for the for the gfx it's the first time i've been asked it uh because obviously we have the gfx 100 which has got ibis in it yeah um it, it's like a, a number of things gfx 100 has got the ibis right yes, so we it. haven't i haven't had up until now people say why don't you do a gfx 50r with ibis all right if using the current ibis technology and the thinking about the size of the gfx 100 is the IBIS technology that we had when the GFX 100 was made made that camera bigger. Hence why it's the size it is. You've got the batteries um, underneath we, and the built-in vertical grip in order to remove that humpback. Yeah? Right, yeah. So if you put the IBIS unit as it stands in the GFX 50R, you're going to either need to have a humpback yeah. to accommodate the IBIS sensor moving and where the battery is going to go, or have a GFX um, 100 star body. Yeah. If the engineers are able to develop, utilizing the magnetic technology, not the spring coil technology that they had from the XH1, and scale that up, so that, I mean, the IBIS unit in the X-T4 is 30% smaller and 20% lighter. Theoretically, 
then yeah, but you're still going to be a slightly bigger camera because look at the X-T4, it's a bigger camera than the X-T3. So where do you draw the line in terms of body size and things like mm. that Put by putting IBIS in? So um, I'd love to see uh, IBIS into uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. But for me, I think that it's going to be, it, it might make the camera too big. I've, I've had the good f- fortune to actually spend a little bit of time online with this next chap uh, in New York, Dennis Lee, who is a phenomenal photographer. And I mean that very genuinely and very sincerely, Dennis. Um, your work is incredible. Um, he sent a question, which which might be a bit unfair, because you were, you were able to go and um, uh, find out about the Australian plans, but you might not be able to answer this one. Fuji America, are they doing anything to promote the brand for professional photographers in the US? The New Jersey Fuji location offers rental equipment, but frankly, the pricing is just... Uh, is just comparable, if not costlier, than the the online rental houses. Um, I guess I'm wondering if Fuji has any sort of program in the US that Andreas might know about that might offer working pros an opportunity to test out the higher end GFX gear without breaking the bank. He said, "I'd happily offer my services <laughs> in, in piloting such a program." I'm sure you would, Dennis. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. It, it's always difficult to comment specifics about um, what marketing activity various uh, countries. Uh, are doing because i mean i look after the uk and ireland and have my dip my toe occasionally into what what happens uh, across europe but um uh, the only thing i know about food from us and and what they offered for the professionals is is the fact that they do have the fps service and they're looking at ways to bring that to uh, x series and not just uh uh, GFX, but I, I, I can't comment. Yeah. I, I honestly don't know. I haven't got a clue about yeah. rental and things like that. I mean, he can move over to the UK and well, we can yeah. loan him stuff yeah. for free for 48 <laughs> hours. But um, Dennis, yeah. Yeah, come over here, mate, because we you know, we need you over here, Dennis. Yeah. <laughs> then you can then you can borrow your heart's content there. I, I was going to say, I mean, that's the thing. We, we uh, during, during um, the lockdown, we realised that people weren't going to be able to go into store um, to, to pick up cameras. So um, utilising the fact that we've got a, a great partnership with our friends at Hire a Camera, yeah. um, we, we offer 48-hour free loans. Yeah, so we, all yeah, people we... need to do are um, pay the deposit. I'm not rubbing it in for everyone that doesn't live in the UK, but I sort of am. So mm. sorry, Dennis. Sorry, Dennis. Uh, Sean Dono, um, any chance of Fujifilm doing a blog or a video to explain how the dark and light multiple exposure settings work on the X-Pro3? I'm learning a bit by using these settings, but would really like to understand how the camera selects the dark or light areas better. Hope that makes sense to you from Sean. Um, yeah, it, it does make sense and, and noted, but um, right now I need to ask the product team in Japan for details how the multiple exposure yeah works and then work from there so um we recently did a blog um on focus stacking so i think doing something on multiple exposure would be a good idea so thanks sean get that mullins to work on it yeah uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> don't sound too enthusiastic please <laughs> no 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 it's a good point i, I could i could uh, ask mullins to do it yeah, yeah. Paul Whitbread, what are Fujifilm's aspirations in the wildlife and sports market? Oh, this is a bit left field, this one, Andreas. We rarely get questions like this. How much of a priority is it to expand on the uh, current telephoto offerings of the 100 to 400 and the amazing 200 F2? He's got two questions. Let's deal with that one first. Yeah. So the thing is, every every manufacturer wants to aspire to expand uh, how many people shoot and the genres that we shoot. So yeah, of course we want to get more wildlife and sports shooters into our system. But I think right now we're currently stuck between a rock and a hard place. We launched something like the 200 mil F2 at the request of sports and wildlife, because we got told, well, you're never going to be taken seriously unless you've got fast telephoto primes. And I appreciate that launching one lens doesn't mean you've got a full range. No. So we launched this lens. Demand hasn't been what we've hoped. And then we've had comments from people like, well, I'm not going to buy a 5,000 pound lens for, to put on a 1,500 pound camera. Yeah. So then stuff like that doesn't help give confidence to our engineers to develop 200 to 600s and 400 mil F2s and 400 mil um, F4s rather. So it, it's, it's frustrating, but it's like a vicious circle. So unless you develop the range of lenses, you won't get people buying into your system people buying into the system might not buy those lenses. Oh, it's so a real chicken and egg problem, this, isn't it? It, it is a chicken and egg problem. And, and it's like, so you either go, right, okay, I'm going to throw the money at it and develop these lenses and show people we've got the range for wildlife and, 
and you, you have to, as as it as Field of Dreams says, build it and they will come. You have to yeah. build the range in the hope that people will buy it. But I think we've just literally right now been a little stung with with how the two hundred mm F two has performed based yeah. on requests from people that didn't actually end up going to buy it which is so frustrating because it is an amazing lens yeah so yeah. you can only do but you can only yeah. work based on photographers opinions and sort of like their feedback And when you get people say make this lens and you make the lens and then you see oh people aren't buying it and then you go right okay why aren't they buying it and they say well you haven't got the pro and in inverted comma body that that lens needs and yeah. like, well, hang on a minute it's <laughs> yeah so unfortunately paul right now um, we haven't got a lens roadmap which includes um telephoto lenses past hundreds 400 or fast telephoto primes but it is something that is hotly uh, contested at yeah. every single product uh, planning meeting that that i'm privy to Paul did have a second question. It's a two-parter. There are some really interesting diffraction optic Fresnel lenses on the market these days, offering longer telephoto lengths that are smaller, lighter, cheaper than their more traditional equivalent, while still offering outstanding image quality. They seem like the perfect pairing for the Fuji X mount. What is the Fujifilm stance on diffraction optics as a lens technology? Uh, pass. Uh, I'm not involved. <laughs> I worked really hard enough. to get that out in one sentence. You I know, <laughs> which is why I was really looking forward to just saying pass. Um, I, I can't comment about the Fujifilm stance on diffraction optics because I'm not involved closely right. enough yeah. into lens technology and I can't. And while I represent the brand in many areas, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the no. engineering team for the lenses. Sorry. Okay. Um, last one. Oh wow. We we um, we've we, well. I was going to say we steamed through them, but it has taken you almost three quarters of an hour. So thank you for this. Yeah, you're welcome. Robert Conahan, um, long time listener, first time caller. He comes from caller. Uh, he comes from Ohio in California. Could Andreas give a, a clear description of what role the X-H2 will play, perhaps, in the future X-Series lineup? We always have an X-H2 question. You, you, yeah, knew, well. you knew you wouldn't get away with it. Yeah. I love the ergonomics and durability of my X-H1. It sounds like he's a big fan of it, to be honest, Andreas. Although, although it's a great video camera, it's an amazing stills camera, and the build quality, I, I feel, was missing in the X-T line. Will it be a flagship model aimed at sports and wildlife photographers? We can't come back to the sports and wildlife again, but they wouldn't be the only people using one, of course. So we, we've always said that the XH line will continue and, and you can see many a senior manager from Japan has, has said this. So, and if I, what's telling to me is the fact that if you look on our Fujifilm hyphen X website and you look at the range of cameras that we have specifically the X series, um, XH is still the first that you see. Yeah. Um, so from a, uh, internal, uh, perception point of view xh1 is the first camera that you see then it goes x pro then it goes xt so xh is still seen as this flagship ideal in terms of the, the slightly more rugged build the slightly bigger body and and yeah maybe not inside but definitely in terms of the build and what have you i would expect any replacement of the xh series to be a flagship um what features it might have and things like that is is anyone's guess well, um, watch this space for all XH2 questions. <laughs> questions, because yeah. we asked them with a, a, a regular annoyance. I think that's the correct phrase. Um, what What's it like at the, at the moment at, uh, at base? Just just to finish off, because I, I know you can't say when the when the hop's going to be open. It's, it's, how long is a piece of string? Question that one. How, how long is a piece of string? Mm. I mean, um, the general manager um, Theo who who manages everything to do with house photography is pulling what little hair he has out, um, trying to work out contingency plans based on what we're getting told from the government and things like that. Um, theoretically, a, I think retail environments are allowed to open from the 1st of June. Mm -hmm. um, however, the, the safety of our staff and our, our customers is the most important thing. So we need to make sure that any environment that we put our staff in and, and customers are coming into is safe and meets all the guidelines. And we've seen, and how we do we implement social distancing? How do you um, talk through the features of a camera with with someone thinking to buy them standing mm. two meters away it's almost um, impossible for for this environment it, isn't it it is how, how do you ensure that people are comfortable touching screens and things like that so you need to make sure that you wipe everything down um 
after every use? How do you make sure the other factor is that are people going to want to travel into London on public transport to visit an experiential retail environment when you're probably still going to be told don't make unnecessary journeys. So yeah, it's, it's going to be a challenge to reopen under current guidelines. Everything Fujifilm related is is ticking along. Um, we're still uh, sending out cameras to journalists, sending out cameras to, to end users that want to borrow them, um, conducting virtual one-to-one sessions instead of face-to-face um, meetings. So we're, we're trying to adapt and, and be business as usual as much as we can. Um, but yeah, it's like running a, it, it's yeah. doing things with one arm tied behind your back. I keep, you know? ha- I keep having my little daydream, Andreas, of uh, being back at the house of photography for a, for a, a real get together again. I think, you know, no, we a get together show. Yeah, we will be back at the house of photography. We will have a reunion show there. I'll, I'll speak on your behalf on that respect, but um, <laughs> you've organized when, it already. <laughs> when, when, when that might be, I, I, I don't know. know. I know. I know. Um, but, but we all look forward to, to doing that and just, uh, yeah, being able to return back to whatever the yeah. new normal is. Well, yeah. I'm looking forward to the new normal, which I hope will not be too unlike the old normal, which I was yeah. quite keen on, to be honest. Now I, now I look back, you know, sometimes I didn't like the old normal. There was some, but I tell you what, it was okay, wasn't it, really? Yeah, yeah exactly. It you, was all you, right. You, you only miss it when it's gone. Don't I know, you? absolutely. Andreas, thank you for your time. As always, um, it, it's it, you're very insightful. It's fantastic to talk to a marketing manager that really knows photography. And, and that was one of the comments that was made about you last time. Uh, from an American um, listener, oh. I think it was. A, uh, oh, thank you very much. It, it was. Hey, look, we've got a marketing manager that actually knows about photography, and I think you so, prove that every single time you talk to us. Yeah, my, my photographic <laughs> background started probably in '93 yeah. when I was given a Practica camera and and put a roll of film in it, and then um, developed my own black and white films at home, and so like studied photography A level, um, studied physics, so have a relatively small understanding of. Um, things that happen inside a camera with the sensors and things like that. Actually, my third year project was making organic LEDs and oh, trying word. to improve their efficiency. Oh, I didn't know about that as your background. Um, yes, yeah, so that's my background. Uh, and then worked at Fujifilm for five years from 2003 to 2008 in the digital camera team. And then um, worked at another consumer electronics company that rhymes with Pony. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and then came back to work for Fujifilm when the opportunity came up. Could you have chosen a different word to rhyme it with, though? <laughs> I, I, I could have chosen a few, uh, but I thought that was the that was the one, one. that was the most amusing one. <laughs> uh, yeah. Andreas, thanks very much. And stay safe with the team, won't you? You too. Take care. And that's it for Sunday's episode. And Ask Andreas Part 2. Keep your questions rolling in because, as Kevin said, whilst we may be in the last week of the Daily Show right now, the main Monday show, uh, which this always was prior to lockdown, is is coming back. They, of course, are longer episodes. Um, hour plus. Um, even more, I think, with some of our plans. And your questions about kits, about photography, about... Even about lockdown, as it's it starts to lessen its its grip on what you're allowed to do and how it affects your photography, they're, they're still really precious to us. So here's the email address: it's click at fujicast.co.uk. Click at fujicast.co.uk. We'll be back tomorrow with a new week of shows. I'll have uh, my announcement for a different type of daily photo show. Oops, did I say daily? And then as the the weeks move ahead, myself and Kev will have some exciting new developments for the Fujicast. Lots to look forward to. See you tomorrow. The Fujicast is an independent Loading Zone production. Goodbye, sweetheart. Well, it's time to go. We're back tomorrow with another show. Well, unless we're fired, we'll talk to you then. Goodbye, sweetheart. Goodbye. Goodbye.